Hi everyone, uh, this is Meenal uh, Agarwal. Today we are going to discuss how to handle standard challenges when leading a boutique valuation practice. Hope this presentation is helpful to each one of you. Okay, so the first question, let me start with a short introduction. I'm a CVA and a part of the standard boards at NACVA. I own a boutique valuation firm, which I started four years ago. And after a seven year stint at Deloitte Valuations Practice, during the course uh, of this entrepreneurship journey, I have overcome various challenges. And I thought this will be a good platform to discuss few of those standard related challenges. To provide a little bit more context, I primarily focus on tax reporting and financial reporting valuations. The first challenge I like to discuss is professional competence. A uh, member shall only expect to complete with a high degree of professional competence. If a member lacks the knowledge or experience to complete such engagements with a high degree of professional competence, the member is not precluded from performing such engagements. In such instance, the member must take steps necessary to gain expertise through additional research, consultation with other professionals believed to have knowledge or experience prior to completion of such engagements. Our industry is ever evolving and many a times I'm offered engagements which are new to me. Sometimes I have to let these engagements go, but I like to suggest a few tips which help me in dealing with these new kind of engagements. The first tip which I'll give is to network with other entrepreneurs to discuss issues. Um, this really gives me a sense of having a team which I can rely on when I have doubts and vice versa. My team, like I have few professionals which are always on my dial and if I get a new project, I'll always make sure to quickly check in with them if they have done something similar. If they have, it gives me confidence that if there's a new engagement which I've not done before, at least I can reach out to these people and you know, kind of discuss on the way if I am on the right track. The second tip, will be to read and keep abreast with latest updates. We can quickly become irrelevant if we are not moving at the pace of the market. The third one will be to attend conferences. This, these conferences help us in both of the two points above in networking and keep abreast with latest changes. The fourth one will be to network with real estate and tangible property valuation practitioners. In our role, sometimes we are required to do purchase price allocation. Um, if the industry is asset heavy, sometimes the client might expect us to collaborate or to at least refer some people from the real estate and tangible property valuations. And given it's a boutique valuation, it's always beneficial to have few contacts in these practices so that you know, we can offer client uh, more options to choose from. Next one will be to disclose to the client when expertise is not available at the start of the engagement. More often than not, if the topic is new, limited number of experts are available in the market. So I'd like to give you a personal example uh, about SPAC. When SPACs were new into the market, I was approached by a known client who wanted me to help them with the SPAC evaluation. It was new for everybody in the industry. Of course, there were a few people, you know, who kind of started before the others. I was very honest with the client and I told them that, you know, I've not done this before. This will be my first SPAC project. Client was more than happy to give me the project. And, you know, over the course of the engagement, I did a lot of research. I spoke to people who have worked on it and kind of, you know, we and the client also shared a lot of links with me, which were helpful. So, Having the client in the know that this was my first SPAC project really helped me. The next point I'll suggest is obviously saying no uh, when you know we can't figure out and if we feel that this project, if we take this project, we might lose client trust and reputation. I'll recommend to say no if this project is something which we believe we'll not be able to do to the best of our ab abilities. The next will be also developing some cross-border connections. 
uh, many a times I get projects where, you know, the client is in Finland and they want a U.S. valuation done because let's say they have some U.S. employees or there is a requirement to do a U.S. valuation. In such cases, if we know people who are in different geographies, they might provide perspective about amortization life, you know, tax rates issues or any other inflationary pressures or risk, which we should be aware of uh, when we are doing when we are dealing with clients in those geographies. In also relation to that, uh, there is an international standard comparison chart uh, on the website, uh, which and where you can learn about the differences between various standards. The standards board is also working on updation of this chart, which will be soon uh, live on the website. So I suggest everyone to be on a lookout for this update on these chart. There's also an international glossary, which the standard board is working on commenting. The second topic, um, the second standard topic will be the content of reports and subsequent updates. In the report, uh, we should always mention whether or not the member is obligated to update the report. Now, sometimes when you know a valuation is closed and the valuation is finalized, sometimes the client come back, sometimes you know they might have changed the projections or they might have changed the cap table or there has been a transaction, like an internal transaction, and they feel that it might impact the valuation and they want us to update the model and the report. So I'll suggest, and this happens to me a lot of time where you know client does not want to pay for an update as such, but wants to update the previous report after finalizing. So I always suggest that we specific, if we want to, we specific include this language in our engagement letters and reports that what are our responsibilities after finalization of the report. Um, we should always over communicate and draw attention to the clause in the report and the engagement letter. We, if, uh, if this is a route you want to take, be clear with the client that no changes will be made for events after evaluation date and after the finalization of report. Encourage them to undertake valuation as of a different valuation date at which an event became known and knowable. The third key challenge will be documentation. Uh, the NACV standard suggests that quantity type and content of documentation are matters of the member's professional judgment. Members should retain documentation for a sufficient time period to comply with legal, regulatory and professional requirements. NACV recommends a minimum of five years. I will recommend saving all client files, communications, draft models, reports, and I'll also suggest to take backups, backups of backups, recommend to save any communications with the client, including emails, messages, online meetings, Nowadays with the Zoom world, a lot of time there are online meetings. So I'll suggest that we take detailed notes and after every meeting, we send client notes uh, and ask them to confirm. Because sometimes it's a point of contention that if we open the model in the report after let's say six months, we'll not remember where that assumption came from. Also maintaining clear work papers with clearly named folders. I like to give an example where, you know, uh, there was a subpoena where uh, the client actually used the valuation for litigation purposes instead of 409A purposes. And I was subpoenaed where uh, I was requested to give the documents, um, where I was requested to give the documents. And because everything was clearly saved uh, and marked, it did not take me too much time to produce that work and kind of reduced a lot of tension in providing those documents. The next issue which I like to discuss is the rule of thumb. Valuation methods are commonly categorized into the asset-based market income or a combination of these approaches. Professional judgment is used to select the approaches and the methods that, this, that best indicate the value. Rules of thumbs are acceptable as reasonable checks but should not be used as a stand-alone stand method. Uh, I like to draw your attention to this part of the standard. We can't use experience to do the valuation of our subject company. 
I many a times hear a rule of thumb about, for example, common shares being a certain percentage of preferred shares. I always like to draw client attention to volatility in the industry, exit term, stage of the company, liquidation preference, participation rights, and other key factors which needs to be kept in mind rather than a rule of thumb. As an another example, at times, client has been on a board of another firm and expect us to use a percentage DLOM which has been used by another valuer on another company. Again, I always emphasize how there is no rule of thumb. In this particular case, I have found justifying using Mandelbaum factors as a helpful tool. Now, what is a rule of thumb? Like I always tell client that there is no rule of thumb and there is none exists and it depends. All the companies are different. These are some additional sources. You can go on this link to find additional sources. Final words in the end, I'll recommend continuous upskilling, documentation, and communication as a key to reduce challenges. Thank you.